we just thank you for um, the fact that we can sit down and just take in the scriptures. And uh, Lord, I pray for this body. I pray for Bart. I lift him up to your throne right now. I pray that you touch him and touch his breathing, touch his lungs, give him good oxygen level. And uh, we pray that your hand of healing would be upon Bart, our brother Bart, uh, this evening. And also other members in this assembly that's hurting, that needs a healing and touch in their bodies. So pray that you would touch them, Lord, and, and heal them. And Lord, um, we, we just thank you for this day. And we know that you are long-suffering, that you're waiting for that last Gentile to come into the fold, and then we're out of here. And Lord, um, the world is getting dark. And there's a lot of tribulation, there's a lot of evil going on, just a lot of darkness. And Lord, help us to, to be the light of this earth, the light of the world, and not to grow weary in well-doing. Help us to be holy as you are holy. Help us to keep our eyes on you and not get distracted, but to run this race and run it well. And so, Lord, we ask that you equip us and empower us. We pray for our nation. Boy, have we slipped. We pray for repentance, that we would repent and turn to you uh, inside and outside the church, that we would call upon you and seek your face, and that you would heal our land. We need your mercy and grace to be upon this nation. And we just pray for that, Lord, that you would just touch us. Bless the study, anoint the message, um, and uh, fill Pastor Don with your, your anointing. And uh, we just thank you for this day, and we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. All right, Ruth chapter 3. I had to look, make sure. <clears throat> Ruth chapter 3. You know, I not only can't see, but don't know whether it's upside down or right side up. So, But we got it now. So as we've gone through Ruth, we've seen... Oh, if you come tonight without a Bible, everybody's got one, right? We're good. All right. Sorry, Gary. <clears throat> so as we've come to this book, this is in the midst of the book of the time of the judges. All heck's breaking loose. They're all disobedient to the Lord. And the things that God told them were going to happen if they didn't uh, you know, honor his word and look to him. The things that were going to happen, they've happened. Now they're in bondage to other countries, to other peoples. They're falling for their gods. And in the midst of all of that, you have this story about a woman named Ruth. One of two women that have books in the scripture and as you look at this story and, and you read through it and it's, and it's really pretty awesome and it's, it's a love story. It's not only a love story for a kinsman redeemer, for this woman that was a, uh, a, a good woman uh, but was from another country, but it's a love story about God for his people and the redemption plan that he has for his people. So it's really interesting to the point of, um, you ha it, it starts out and you have these two people named Elimelech and you have Ruth. And Naomi, I'm sorry, and you have Naomi. And they live in the land of bread, don't they? They live in Bethlehem. They have no reason to leave, but the famine comes into the land, so what do they do? They pick up and they leave. They don't, they don't trust in the Lord. And, and the worst part about it is, is this was God's judgment on this nation, was the, uh, the famine that was in the land. But they didn't see it. They didn't repent. They just picked up and said, hey, let's go over here. So they go to Moab. Their sons... They have two sons, one's named Sick, and the other one's named Tired. 
So they were sick and tired. I don't know whether they were sick and tired of their kids or sick and tired of their circumstances or whatever, or maybe sick and tired of God. So they leave and they go to the land of Moab. Their sons marry, marry two pretty good women, one exceptional. The sons die, there's no children. The husband dies. So Naomi has what left? Two daughter-in-laws. And she says, her decision is, let's go back to the house of bread because she heard in the house of bread that there was food, that there was bread. So she sets out to go there. She goes. She tells both the daughter-in-laws, you know, don't come with me. I'm an old woman. There's no way I'm getting married. Uh, you know, even if I get married, you know, if I have sons, and then, which is probably an impossibility, but if I do, are you going to wait till they're grown up? So, and you're going to be old. You're probably not going to be able to have kids. So, you know, I release you from all your responsibility. Just go. And go in back to your own land, to your own gods, she tells them, right? The land of Moab. Go there. Let me go back to my land and my God and my people. And so one of them says, Yeah, it's a good idea. The other one, named Ruth, says, No way. I'm not going anywhere. Actually, she says this Entreat me not to leave or to turn back. This is verse 16 of chapter 1. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you from me. And it's interesting there, she says the Lord Jehovah. She's probably seen and heard of Jehovah. She sees what the type of woman that Naomi was, and she believes. She believes in Jehovah. She believes in the God of the, of the Bible. What a testimony for Naomi in the midst of her dismal circumstances, because that's what they are. So she comes back. People see her coming from the city and say, hey, there is Naomi, pleasant and she says, don't call me that. Call me bitter. I want to be bitter. Call me Mara. Because the Lord, the Lord has afflicted me. Well, the Lord didn't afflict her. She left the covering of the Lord and walked away. But the Lord had a plan. Just like he does in our life. Sometimes we see things and, and we go through things. We... Uh, you know, our, um, something happens. We lose our job. We, somebody's sick or, or whatever the case may be. And we go th through things. And, but see, God never, but God said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. So does that mean we run away like Naomi did? No. No. But we are to trust and to rest in the Lord and his goodness. And when we do, things happen. We don't know what God's going to do tomorrow. Does anybody here know, have any idea what's going to happen in the next hour? Other, other than, rest assured, I'll be done by then. So you can't say that. Anybody know what's going to happen? Do you know what you're going to hear? Because I don't know what I'm going to say, so I don't know how you'd know what you were going to hear. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day? No, we don't. But we rest and we trust in the Lord. And see, his, this book, this book is such a love story for the nation. But it's also a redemption story. So it, not only for the nation of Israel, but for each one of us. God's plan of redemption is throughout the words on these page. Remember, he, he didn't write this for Ruth or Boaz or Naomi or Abimelech. He wrote it for you, for the reader, for the, 
for the purpose of someone who goes to the seventh book of the Bible. The number of perfection. And we see God's love and redemption, redemption plan in the seventh book of the Scriptures. So last week, uh, Naomi encourages Ruth to go out and glean from the fields. They have nothing. They have no food. She's a widow. She's got nobody to take care of. As far as she knows, she doesn't have any family. She's bitter against God because of what he did to her. He didn't do anything to her. She did it to him because of their disobedience, because she walked away from him. He told her what was going to happen. He wrote throughout the scriptures, hey, if you guys do this, this is what's going to happen. He didn't cause it to happen. It happened because of their disobedience. So she tells Ruth to go out and glean in the fields. Now remember, we talked about this last week. It was in Leviticus. And uh, we talked about how, you know, when you cleaned your field or harvested your field, uh, you come to the, uh, the corners and you weren't allowed to pick the corners because they were for the poor. So this is Naomi tells Ruth. Ruth goes out and starts picking the corners. And she finds out that there was a man named Boaz who, had, who owned that land. And he saw her. And he said, oh, well, you can glean from the field. Because he knew her in the sense of everybody had been talking about how good Ruth was, what kind of character she had. She wouldn't leave her mother-in-law. She was there to take care of her. Naomi couldn't come out to the fields and glean them. She was probably too old. Now, of course, we're just speculating that, but why didn't she go? Because she was probably too old. She probably couldn't do it. So Boaz sees her, he knows who she is, and, and it just, and, and I love this part of the scripture where it talks about it just happened to be Boaz's field. Boaz was a kin to Naomi. She wasn't the closest he wasn't the closest kin. There was some other, in which we're going to see next week. But it was still a kin. It was still a kin. So it, it said, the scripture said that it just happened that Ruth would be in her field. No, it didn't just happen. That was part of God's plan. So she got all this barley as, the, as they were going through the, uh, the fields to harvest the barley. And we left off last week in verse 23. It says, so she stayed, this chapter 2, so she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. So the harvest basically was done. Several months had gone by. Remember, we talked about a couple of weeks ago in chapter 1, at the very end of chapter 1 in verse 22, it said, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem when? At the beginning of the barley harvest. Remember that? Remember when we talked about that? What day was that? Anybody remember? What? It was right after the Passover. It was Resurrection Day. It was April 17th, the day of resurrection. Remember, they would come on, uh, on the 10th of the month. And what day was that? Anybody remember? Jesus rode in on a donkey. Palm Sunday, remember? They would come. They would check to see if the harvest was ready. I'm sorry, they would, they would come at the, at the first of the month and check, and then they would wait two weeks, which would be the Passover. So they couldn't do it, so they would have to wait till after the Sabbath, which would be the 17th. Interesting, huh? So she rides in 
a book of redemption and God's love, rides in or walks in at the beginning of the barley harvest, which would be the 17th, the day, of re the day that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Oh, that's just a happenstance. No, it's not. No, it's not. So for these months, from April 17th till uh, probably the fall, when the harvest would finish. So they come to the end, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Verse 3, then they, or chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that if may be well with you. This word here, security, is rest. Resting in the arms of a husband. Resting in the arms of a kinsman redeemer. Secure in that rest. Shall I not seek rest? For you that it may be well with you you know what was that uh what was that movie matchmaker matchmaker send me a match this is what the lady was doing that was a jewish movie i don't remember the name of it but fiddler on the roof thank you whoever said that no homework next week for you <laughs> so naomi was a matchmaker that's what all good mother-in-laws do right so I will not seek security for you that it may be well with you. I, I will not seek rest for you. Shall I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? A covering. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative or a kinsman redeemer? That's what it means. In fact... He is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. I think she has a plan. I think she has a plan. So what they would do in those days, because Bethlehem was a relatively small city, they would have one threshing floor, and everybody would use it. So as you would pull in your crops, they would give you a period of time to do this. So usually during the day, what they would do is you would take your wheat or whatever and you'd get it set up and you'd find out when you would be uh, threshing on the threshing floor. They'd give you a time, say 8 o'clock at night. And they used to do it at night because usually late afternoons the winds would come up and you needed the winds to blow. Because what they would do is they would, they would beat the wheat. Well, the wheat would come off and lay on the ground, the wind would pick up the chaff, which was very light, and it would come up, and the wind would blow it away, so that all you had left was what? The wheat, the harvest, the fruit. So it was beaten. Kind of sounds like some of the parables we went through this past Sunday, or actually the last couple weeks. But they would beat this chaff, and it would come up. So he's, she's saying here, it's not... In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. He'll, it'd be his turn. Do you think she's trying to hook him up? <laughs> you bet your life. You bet your life. So <clears throat> she had a plan. And she says, therefore, wash yourself. Probably a good idea. Take a bath. Anoint yourself or put perfume on. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to that man, Boaz, until he is finished eating and drinking. Now she has a purpose for this. But above all the purpose this, that Naomi has, God has a purpose for this, doesn't he? Because see, we've read past the book of Ruth. We've read the book of Matthew and Luke, and we see whose name in it, in the line of Jesus Christ, right? The real kinsman redeemer. Boaz is just a type, pretty good one. 
But as you go through there, you see Ruth's name, don't you? Grandmother of who? David. David. Great-grandmother, I'm sorry. She had Obed, Obed had, yeah, some other guy, and then David. So I can't think of his name right now. I just drew a blank. Jesse, who said that? No homework for you either. <laughs> so see, God has a plan, doesn't he? A plan from the beginning. All right, you want to go there? Well, I'm going to give you this gal named Ruth, and you're going to end up being a widow just like Ruth, but she's going to follow you around because she loves you. And you know why she loves you? Because she loves me. She loved God, so she loved Ruth. So, <clears throat> go there. Anoint yourself. Put on some perfume. Wash yourself. You, you know, you're probably dirty. You just come out of the field. The harvest just ended, and you got stuff all over your face. And Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. Look, ladies, if you're out looking for a guy, make sure you... Take a shower and, you know, anoint yourself and, and uh, put on a decent garment. Don't go there with holy clothes on. But anyway, go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known. Don't, don't tell them who it is. Don't let anybody see you. You're going to see that coming up until he has finished eating and drinking. Now, this is an interesting thing here because Boaz, uh, it says that he... Uh, was wealthy, but that word, we saw that word may, meant valor. He was a mighty man of valor. But he probably did have wealth. He had a lot of crops, so he was probably wealthy. But he was out doing what? Working in the fields right alongside his servants. Had he not been, had he not been, he probably would have never met Ruth. But see, Boaz was a man of character, wasn't he? He wasn't proud saying, hey, you know what, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I'm the big cheese. I own the company. He didn't do that. He worked right alongside his servants. And here he is with his crops. So God is definitely using a man of good character. He says, no, known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking, then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place. So watch him. Watch where he goes. Where the place where he lies down. Make sure you make note of it. Because it's dark. Remember? At night you go and you, when the winds are blowing, the wheat and the chaff or the barley and the husks all get blown away. Then you eat and you're going to see he's laying next to his barley or the wheat, whatever, his crop, his fruit. So it's nighttime. So he, she's saying to Ruth, look, go there just make notice of where he's at. Make note of it. Because they didn't have flashlights, did they? And you couldn't take a torch. You got all that grain and everything there. You know, you're looking over here to make sure, you know, and you look this way and this guy's on fire. You just lit his beard on fire, you know. Oh, well, wait a minute. I'm looking for, you know, Boaz. So here, make note so that you can go to him. Make note of this. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall take notice of the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. Hmm. What does this uncover your feet mean? Well, it's a proposal for marriage. She is proposing by uncovering his feet that she wants to marry him. Interesting, isn't it? 
Okay, there's a guy I like. Let me run over there and uncover his feet. <laughs> See, women, now you just learned. If you're out for a guy, looking for a guy, go uncover his feet. But there's more to that. Now, I heard a story. Let's see if I can get this right. This was years ago. Uh, it was a Calvary pastor, and he, uh, him and his wife were dating, and they used to go on uh, Friday nights to a movie, a drive-in movie. And he had a friend who was another pastor of a church, and he was dating this other girl, gal. And uh, they were, uh, um, th so they would double date, you know, and they'd keep each one of them, you know, honest and stuff like that, so there was no hanky-panky going on. So one day, uh, they were supposed to go, and the one guy's girlfriend was sick, so she couldn't go. So they said, come on, come on, just go with us anyway, it's okay. So the, 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 the one guy and gal were sitting in the front, and, and uh, the guy sitting in, in the, other guy, the other guy was sitting in the back of the car. Well, they had two movies, so uh, the one guy says, hey, you guys want anything? And, and uh, he says, they both said no. So he goes, well, I'm going to get a pop and some popcorn and stuff. And so he leaves and goes over to the concession stand. Well, when he comes back, he sees that uh, his friend was now sitting in the front seat with his girlfriend. And he's like, what the heck? So he thinks, well, you know what? I'm not going to say anything, I, you know, because they're probably just doing it to get me, to get a rise out of me, you know, make fun of me. Oh, well, you got all mad. You got jealous and stuff like that. So he gets in the car and he sits in the back. And he was kind of distressed, so he wouldn't make eye contact with them. But he could see, you know, that they were, you know, looking at each other and, and whispering to one another. But he was, there was no way he was going to make, make eye contact because, you know, he, he, they, he didn't want them to think that they were getting to him, okay? Well, finally, after a few minutes, uh, after several minutes, they kind of turned around and said, hello. And he looked up. <laughs> and it was two other people. He had gotten in the wrong car. <laughs> so you got to make sure you go and lie in the right place or you can uncover somebody's feet that, uh, you know, you don't really want. But uh, <laughs> that's a good story. I'm glad I had this opportunity to kind of throw that in there. But... <clears throat> Anyway, it says, uh, uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Basically, if he covered up his feet and told her to leave, he didn't accept the proposal. And she said, and she said Naomi said to her, Ruth, all that you say, or, uh, I'm sorry, Ruth said to Naomi, all that you say to me, I will do. Now that there is a miracle in itself, isn't it? You ladies out there, are you that close to your mother-in-law? <laughs> Usually not, right? Hopefully you are. But that would be a miracle in itself because most women are not that close to their mother-in-law. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, she gives you a lot of advice. Oh, you shouldn't put this, you know, carpet in. You should put this one. Well, I don't like that carpet. I like this one. Oh no, this is more practical. Your husband will like it better, right? How many of us guys listen to our father-in-law? Exactly. <clears throat> and she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So he went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her, so she went down to the threshing floor and did all according to that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, not that he got drunk, he just drank, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of a heap of grain and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. So here this guy, he had eaten, he had drank, he was cheerful, and he went to guard his crop. 
laying there by the grain. What a character. What character he has. And at the end of the heap of grain where he was laying, she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Now it happened at midnight, so maybe he was laying there for a while, I don't know, that the man was startled. Well, yeah, he felt something furry down at his feet, you know, or her long hair. They probably didn't cut their hair much in those days, especially Jewish women. But he probably felt, oh, what is that? Now, anybody ever woke up in the middle of the night and you had maybe out camping and you had something in your, you know, sleeping bag or something, and you're like, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel something? When I do that, when, uh, I always think of The Godfather, you know, the movie The Godfather, you know, and the horse being in the bed. So, <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> he feels something. He's startled, and he turned himself, and there was a woman, was li- and a, a woman was lying at his feet. That'll start to look pretty good, wouldn't it? Yep. Here's this guy, and there's a woman at my feet. What the heck? You know, Adam, God put him to sleep. He woke up, and what? He was married. Right? How about Jacob? He goes to sleep, he wakes up, and he's married to somebody else. Wait a minute, what's going on? So guys, don't sleep too hard. You never know what the Lord's going to do. If you're a single guy, you could wake up tomorrow and, oh, what's that? It could be a woman. If it is, you're in trouble. So anyway. Um, see, this woman lying in his feet, and he says, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. He probably didn't recognize her, remember? She took a shower and put on perfume and a new garment. He probably didn't recognize her at all. Who are you? I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. You are a kinsman redeemer. Take your relative under your wing. And that's what he would have to do. He would have to cover her with the corner of her blanket, of his blanket. He would cover his feet and cover her. But it's interesting, this word here, under your wing, under the place of rest. Now, Ezekiel chapter 16, see if I can find it here pretty quick, right after Jeremiah and before Daniel. I believe it's verse 8, 16. Yes. Yes. God's, he's God telling Ezekiel his love for Jerusalem. Verse 8 says, When I pass by you again and I looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Here's the marriage proposal. God covering his children. She says, take me under your wing, for you are a kinsman, Redeemer. Redeemer. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor, poor or rich. So what is he saying? He said, look, you know, you're an awesome gal. Look at what you did. You hung with with Naomi. You didn't let her go. 
You came and you picked at the field. The field that God sent her to, by the way, right? It didn't just happen that way. But see, you have shown more kindness than that. And you were awesome at that. But now you show even more, even more kindness here at the end. You didn't go after the young man. So obviously he's probably an older fellow. Whether rich or poor. You didn't go after somebody so you could make it easy on yourself. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, he tells her not to fear. Why? It's dark. He didn't know who she was. She might have recognized his voice, but she probably couldn't see his face. And it's kind of like for us, isn't it? We can't see the face of the Lord, can we? But we can hear his voice, right? We can speak to him, and the more we speak to him, the more we know his voice, and we know it's him. But we haven't seen him. Yeah, we can get glimpse of, glimpses of him and his love in the faces of other people, but it's still not him. You know, we can get glimpses in the, in, the, in the faces of our spouses and how much they love us and care for us. And we know their voice. And they get that through Jesus Christ, don't they? They get that through the Lord. The Lord has given our spouses that love. Okay, and just one day wake up and say, well, let's see. I'm going to be a better man today. I'm going to love everybody. Okay, good luck with that. So he tells her, don't fear. Don't fear. It's me. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Proverbs 31 says this. Uh, we probably all know this. Proverbs 31. Who can find a virtuous wife? A wife of valor. That's what this means. For her worth is far above rubies. Now, as you look at that and you say, okay, that's great, you know, I got to find, uh, you know, a virtuous wife. Well, maybe you need to pray to the Lord to put you to sleep so that when you wake up, you're either married or somebody's laying at your feet, uncovered your feet, right? And that fur or hair that you feel is not your cat. Or your dog. Anyway. So who can find a virtuous wife for her worth as far above rubies? Was the worth, we looked at it last week, about the man that went out and found a treasure, didn't we? He what? He sold everything to get that treasure, didn't he? Jesus. You're that treasure. You're that virtuous wife, the bride of Christ. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above. It's the way God looks at you. I know you look at that person in the mirror and go, not again. I know we stumble and fall. We do stupid things. God still forgives us. He loves us hasn't changed. Don't fear. You're forgiven. It's paid for. You are my virtuous wife. 
And your value is more than anything else, right? Back to Ruth. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. So, you know, the first time he met her, he probably went, you know, got on his computer and he Googled, you know, relatives of Naomi. You know, and he found out, oh, there's this one here. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Should I bump this guy off? What should I do? No. So he knows. He Googled. He did some research. Why? Because he loved her too, didn't he? There is a close relative. Now remember, if a man married a woman and he died, then the brother would take the place of the man, right? And have to marry his brother's wife and have a kid to prolong the name, to prolong that, that name of that husband that died. Kinsman, redeemer. To keep the line going. So, by law, one of the, clo the, the closest relative would really have to take care of Naomi. So, here you have Ruth, because Naomi's older. She probably can't have kids, so she wouldn't qualify. But her daughter would. Now, yes, it's a daughter-in-law. But see, this is all part of God's plan. So he says, there's a relative closer than I. And he says, stay this night and in the morning. It shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative or of a kinsman for you, good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. Now, this is an interesting statement that he makes because of the fact that of what it means. See, there's several different meanings here. Why would he tell her to stay close? He could get himself in a lot of trouble. Here's this woman laying down at the feet of this man. Now, yes, she came to propose to her kinsman redeemer, but she shouldn't be there. But she is. If she left in the middle of the night and tried to go home, she would probably get jumped. When they found out that she wasn't a Jew, they could do whatever they wanted with her. So he tells her, look, lie down here until the morning. You know, your reputation, if you get up and somebody sees you, you're going to have a bad reputation. It's obvious the fact that he loves this Ruth so if he loves her, he respects her, doesn't he? And that's a note for you gals, let me tell you. Any guy that says, oh, you know, you say you love me, but, you know, you won't do this with me. Well, you wait till we're married. If he respects you enough, he'll wait. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose before one could recognize another. It was dark. She got up before it was light out. And he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So he didn't want anybody to know. Hush, hush. It's quiet. Also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephaths, which is about 60 pounds of barley, and laid it on her. That's right. Just lay it right on her. Then she went into the city. So 
she puts her shawl out or her covering uh, that she had, that she brought uh, with her, and almost be like a, a coat of some sort. And he put 60 pounds of grain, of barley. Not that she didn't take home a lot of barley before, but he laid it on her, he gave it to her. She must have been a strong woman, you know. I don't know how far she lived, but to carry 60 pounds of barley in your coat, he probably wrapped it up for her and she slung it over her shoulder. And she went into the city. Now, it's interesting because if you have a certain... <laughs> It's kind of like a big deal. It's not a big deal. So when they first did uh, in, the, in the King James, the 1611 Bible, they first came out with the first printing. It said he went into the city instead of she went into the city. So they realized their mistake, and they turned it around, and the next printing in that same year, it said she. So the 11611, the first print, is called the he Bible. This is just stupid. And the other one is the She Bible. All right, so now you know something you probably never wanted to know. There you go. If you get a tribunal, is it he or is it she? Well, it depends on what Bible. All right, I think those are all NIV anyway. But anyway, uh, when she came to her mother in law, she said, is, is that you, my daughter? In other words, if you look at this in the Hebrew, what she said to her was, what has changed? She knew what she sent her out for. She was saying, how did it go? What happened? Ooh, did it work? Matchmaker, matchmaker, send me a match. I don't know the song, so that's as far as I'm going. That's probably good. You don't have to listen to me sing. Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. Hey, what's up? What did, what did he say? Oh, he covered me with the corner of his garment. He said yes. But see, Naomi knew something too, didn't she? That he wasn't the closest. Verse 17, and she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. The real stand-up guy. Yeah, he loves this gal and he'd do anything. You remember how nice you were to your mother-in-laws in the beginning before you got married when you just met, you know, you met this girl and she takes you home and you had proper manners, you know. It's not like nowadays, you know, most of the kids are clothes are holy and stuff and yeah hey what's up mom <laughs> but so he gives her the six ephahs of bar barley and she said he said do not go empty handed to your mother-in-law then she said sit still trust trust my daughter until you know how the matter will turn out for the man will not rest. He will not stop. There's no way until he has concluded the matter this day. I know what's happening. There's somebody else. Let him work it out. Just be still. Just rest. Trust him. Trust in the Lord. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Be still and let the Lord work. Trust, because this man won't rest. This kinsman redeemer will not stop. So Ruth's rest is in the redeemer, isn't it? Just like ours. And Jesus won't stop until we're in heaven with him. 
Will he? Ah, he wants his bride. He wants his virtuous wife. So we're to rest in him. And Ruth is to rest in Boaz, knowing that Boaz won't stop. He won't give up. He won't accept second best. Let him figure this out. And he does. But we're not going to talk about that. That's for next week. But see, as I was going today and uh, had an emergency, actually had two emergencies today, and usually Wednesdays I don't work because uh, I'm too busy studying. And uh, so I had two emergencies today, so one of them I had to go to earlier this morning, and then the second one come. But I didn't go to that one because I was there all day. I think I got home at 4 o'clock. So you do the math. How long did I have to study? Now, I study every day. So, but it was interesting because I usually on Wednesdays spend several hours. And the whole time I'm like, Lord, uh, do you know that uh, I have to teach tonight? Or did you forget that? Did it slip your mind? No, it didn't slip my mind. I know. And the thing that kept coming is, do you trust me? Are you going to rest in me? Or are you going to look at the circumstances? Hmm. Well, let me think here. <laughs> no. And although it was very hard, because as I kept looking at my watch and going, okay, now it's noon. Oh, it's 1 o'clock. Oh, now i got to run to the store and get some parts. And the time just is just flying on by. Lord, what are we going to do here? <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I'm ready. Are you ready? No, I'm not ready. Well, just trust me. Just trust me. Just rest in me. And this is for all of us. Think about this. I was talking to somebody about it before we started. What have we been talking about? Are we resting in Christ for our salvation? Is he our redeemer? Are we okay? Look, at, we're in the book of Ruth, a book of love and redemption and God's rest for us through the redemption, God's love for us. God telling Naomi, no, 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 no don't leave. Trust me, trust me. Look at what we're going through on Sunday. Oh, here's this parable. We don't understand it. Ah, but you're my sons. You're my disciples. I will give you what you need to know. Just trust. Rest in me. It's okay. I'll take care of it. I'll do it. In a men's group, on Monday, we talked about rest. What does that mean? Are we trusting in the Lord? Are we comfortable with Him? Can we relax and say, Lord, I don't need to stress out over this, although this circumstance looks pretty bad. It's 4 o'clock and uh, I got nothing. I got nothing. And I still have nothing because I don't know what I said. But see, the whole time, the Lord kept saying, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Then just rest. Well, what do you think we've been talking about for the last few weeks? Do we trust him? Do we? Can we say, I'll rest in you, Lord. I'll be the vine and you be the tree. I'll just hang on. I trust you. I can only rest in you. Amen? Well, if you have a need, come on up here for prayer. If you have a sickness, you know, Jerry should be up here for Ann.
we'll dump oil on his head and he can go over and squeeze it out on Ann. And then the rest of you should come up here to pray for Ann. If you need somebody to pray with or about. Okay? Well, Father, we just so thank you. <laughs> this was written to us. We are the readers. And we're so grateful for your love, for your mercy. And someday, we're going to be in heaven with you and we're going to understand your love. But until then, Lord, just keep reminding us through your word. Father, may we rest in you. May we truly trust you. May we hold on and cling to you, Lord. May we uncover your feet so that you could cover us in your love in your mercy and in your grace. Father, our heart's desire is to serve you better, to love you more and more each day, to continually be changed into the image of your Son. As we get closer and closer to the time that you call us all home, to where we can hear those words we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And we can truly understand that love, that forgiveness, that redemption. Because you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we may be that virtuous bride. Father, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, I ask that you bless each and every one that came here tonight. May our eyes be open to what you're working out in our life, even though it seems like you're not there. But Lord, I ask that you bless us from the top of our head to the bottom of our foot. That you just pour blessing upon blessing on us. And Lord, that we may know that we're going to rest in you no matter what. May that be our heart's desire. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said...